Hello, this is Kristen Anderson of Microwave Journal, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the latest installment in our technical education webinar series. Today's session is entitled Peregrine's Ultra CMOS Technology Delivering Intelligent Integration. Our presenter today is Peter Bacon, Director of System Integration at Peregrine Semiconductor. Peregrine Semiconductor Corporation is the founder of RF Silicon on Insulator, SOI, and pioneer of advanced RF solutions. Since 1988, Peregrine and its founding team have been perfecting Ultra CMOS technology, a patented advanced form of SOI that delivers best in class performance and monolithic integration. From roots in government research and development innovation, Peregrine continues to revolutionize the industry with high-performance integrated RF solutions. Before we start, there are a few items that I would like to bring to your attention. Today's presentation is approximately 45 minutes long, after which we will hold a 15-minute question and answer session with our presenter. You may ask a question any time throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar in the bottom right side of your screen or the Q&A panel, again, on the right side of your screen. Please ensure your send to is set to all panelists. This presentation will be archived and available for viewing later on the event section of the Microwave Journal website. Also, if anyone would like to see more detail in the slides, simply click on the Enlarge button on your screen. At this point, I would like to introduce today's presenter. Peter Bacon is Director of System Integration at Peregrine Semiconductor, where he oversees product requirements definition, technology feasibility studies, and application support. Peter has over 30 years of RF product development experience gained at Peregrine, Skyworks, Connexent, IBM, Raytheon, and Harris Microwave. He received his BSEE and MSEE degrees from Lehigh University and his MBA degree from Boston University. And now let's give our attention to Peter. All right, thank you, Kristen. It's great to be here today, and thank you for the opportunity to review the topic of delivering intelligent integration and how Peregrine's Ultra CMOS facilitates it. Uh, Peregrine, the founder of commercialized RF SOI, continues to revolutionize the industry with high-performance, highly integrated RF solution. And this talk will cover three specific examples of intelligent integration, and will follow the outline shown below. Um, this is uh, the intent of the talk is to give a very brief silicon sapphire introduction. What is Ultra CMOS, and then discuss why do we want to integrate and the reason we would want to integrate is really the benefits that would come from integration. That would be performance or perhaps a greater complexity can be achieved or greater flexibility. And then the ultra CMOS advantages. What advantages does the technology bring to the RF space? And uh, briefly touch on development cost implications of integration. And then we'll dive deep into three examples covering intelligent integration and uh, we'll focus on enhanced performance through integration and expanding the capability of power limiters specifically and then touch base on uh, increased system level features that can be achieved and this will address uh, some of our latest global one performance and then we'll wrap up with the summary and conclusion. So one slide covering silicon on sapphire, ultra CMOS. This is a combination of the most widely used semiconductor technology, CMOS, with a near-perfect insulating substrate, Sapphire. And this is, uh, when you look at CMOS, you really come to scalability as a, a key factor. You, we are following the bulk of the semiconductor industry by following the, the CMOS path. And because of that, we get into lowest power and lowest cost from that technology. And it also lends itself very well to a fabulous model. And when we go to Sapphire, that's sort of the extreme SOI technology. You don't have to worry about the any sort of loss from the substrate. It's uh, much better than some of the even most uh, commonly used RF substrates. So it's got very good RF and microwave properties. And then its supply chain continues to mature. Um, we continue to use just a fraction of what's being used by the LED market. And then also other markets are starting to use Sapphire because it's a harder material than glass and things 
such as camera lens covers for smartphones are continuing to push the demand for Sapphire higher. And so combining these two technologies, CMOS and Sapphire, for a very good SOI technology, it provides Peregrine with a unique position in the industry, and we continue to leverage better performance across all of our products. And it enables the integration of very good performance, high performance RF circuitry with analog and digital content. And that's really the strength that uh, we'll be looking at today. So why do we integrate? Is it just for the sake of integration? And that's obviously a, a no answer. But in, in terms of why would we integrate, we're looking for increased functionality and complexity. And also in our case, we're looking for performance. Uh, we're not uh, looking solely to increase our digital gate count per millimeter squared gate density effectively. But rather, we're looking to augment our RF performance with digital content, analog content. And when we look at our uh, competitive uh, solutions like multi-chip modules, there's still a number of limitations that are faced in terms of trying to integrate with a multi-chip module. And the, the key one is really the heavy constraints that are placed on inter-die IOs and signal routing. So when I want to control a single device somewhere far deep into the circuitry, I have to weigh the the penalty of doing that with an actual I.O. interface and connecting through the uh, substrate that's used for the multi-chip module and so forth. So there's a, a big constraint that is placed on making the circuit as flexible and complex as, as needed for the solution. And then a, another aspect of MCMs is you're putting together dye that are unrelated to each other. They've not been manufactured necessarily even by the same fab and also different wafer lots. And so you, you lose the tracking ability of device to device uh, behavior. So that limits you in terms of what you can do in terms of control options and optimization schemes so that you, you really are trying to control things from a, a much higher level metric and oftentimes uncorrelated one to the other. So what do we mean by intelligent integration? By intelligent integration, we refer to the intelligent aspect. We're either adding to the, the system understanding, so we're building in intelligence that uh, we've gained on how the, the system needs to operate or uh, things about the environment that will come into play, or we're making just sound judgment that we're using strengths of the technology that uh, can really benefit the overall system. So they're those two aspects were either providing greater system capability and flexibility or were leveraging the strengths of the technology. And then the integration is pretty straightforward. We're, we're taking something that's a part and making it uh, something part of a larger thing, so we're adding it to other circuitry. So that's very straightforward. And the, the primary reason we do that is there's perceived market value in doing that. So either through better accuracy, higher performance, more features, improved ease of use, reconfigurable, uh, increased flexibility, and greater manufacturing uniformity. If there isn't that market value, then we're not going to be able to overcome the increased NRE that comes along with integration. So we have, in general, cost and yield improvements that will come because of integration, but there is the higher NRE expense that needs to be matched with a greater market value and the ROI. Our first example today that we're going to look at is uh, looking primarily at the integration and performance results from that integration. And this is a KU band up conversion mixer. It's fully integrated. It's uh, a doubly balanced image rejects mixer. And it eliminates the need for two distinct mirrored double balanced mixers that is commonly used in the marketplace. It does make use of a, a diode ring mixer for doing each of the doubly balanced mixers. And this is for improved LO RF performance. Uh, FET architecture could be used for the, the primary mixer core. And that's actually done in uh, a related down conversion mixer for improved intermodulation performance. So you can usually make a trade between diode and FET uh, performance. Uh, it does leverage low-loss ultra ultra CMOS substrate, and 
this really is leveraged by a lot of the distributed structures on the, the mixer itself. Uh, for the assembly of this part, it goes into a, a ceramic package that is leveraging uh, CPW transitions to make the input-output connections, and then it uses a wire bond for the interface, both for ground as well as the RF connections. Uh, in the right-hand side is showing the configuration for the tests and measurements that will be coming uh, shortly. So looking at the detail of the architecture more fully, uh, here we have a block diagram. And is shown for each one of these mixers, we have uh, two balance that are driving the mixer core made of the diode ring. So the balance are coming from the LO port and the RF port and creating the uh, differential and signal that's needed to drive the diode ring. And then the IF is taken out. So this is one mixer. And you can see in the dive uh, drawing here that there are two next to each other. And for the LO port to make the quadrature signal, uh, signal we have a line coupler that's integrated. Balans are also integrated for the LO and RF as, as shown in the diagram here, and then the line coupler. Uh, performance for this mixer emphasizes conversion gain, where we have just slightly less than 10 dB of conversion loss at the low end of the KU band, and then going up towards 20, it approaches just under 14. And this is with an IF of 1 gigahertz and a low drive of 15 dBm across the band. For image rejection, we're getting better than 20 dB across the band. And there are points where it approaches 30, and even a few peaks getting up to 35 uh, dB of rejection. And then looking at the LO to RF isolation, again, this being the primary metric for going with the diode architecture, getting better than 40 dB of LO to RF isolation. Small peak there just coming above 40. But other points where we're approaching about 45 dB of LO to RF isolation. And then IP3 versus the LO level behaving very well. You'd expect this to track virtually a, a 1 dB per uh, input power on the LO port for the improvement in input IP3. And just looking at numbers real quickly here at 8 dBm, about 13, going down another 10 dB, 18, we're getting up to about 22. So it's just under a, a 1 to 1 ratio there. A very good performance out through uh, getting up to 24 dBm of input IP3. So in summary, some of the points demonstrated on intelligent were leveraging the low-loss substrate with a high-performance device. So this allows us to do a fully integrated, um, and we'll touch on the, the points that are leveraged by the integration. And then also we have demonstrated increased our performance uh, because of that in terms of IP3 and LO to RF isolation and image rejection compared to other commercial options. And so this is a comparison of how this part stacks up against some other uh, competitive parts that are in the marketplace. And emphasis here on LO to R RF isolation while being very competitive on IP3. In terms of integration, uh, we've been able to optimize the quadrature signal generation and routing so that it's very uniform across the frequency range. And it minimizes uh, board space and bomb count. So this is fully integrated and simplifies the uh, structure that's needed at the PCB or laminate level in terms of integrating this into a higher level system. And also it provides improved manufacturing uniformity between the two double balance mixers in an image, re image rejection architecture. So we don't have to worry about the uh, variations that would come from a wafer manufacturing. And since this is also in a CMOS environment, it tightens up uh, variations in terms of metal uh, uh, separations and widths. Uh, the formation of the, the metal is uh, much better than you would find in other technologies. And the uniformity and overall yield is improved using uh, the bulk C the, the CMOS technology as the fundamental process uh, behind this uh, device. Some other microwave distributed structures that are employed by this mixer. This is a little more detail on the line coupler that's used. 
It's about 1,600 microns in length and uses a line width of 7 microns, line spacing of 9. And this is looking at the EN simulation from DC to 100 gigahertz. Um, I should say it was simulated over that range, but you're seeing just the KU band here showing the magnitude uh, balance across the, uh, the input to the two different outputs. So very well behaved and looking at the phase mismatch about a one degree difference across that entire range as well. And then the return loss is uh, very tight, uh, looking very good, about 20 dB across the frequency range also for all three ports. So as we come to uh, look at other microwave elements, the technology really lends itself to doing coupler structures, inductive, high-frequency distributed elements. And that's because the ultra CMOS loss tangent is even better than alumina. It's coming in at uh, 1.4 to uh, times 10 to the minus fourth, and that's at 19 gigahertz. So from a substrate perspective, it's very rock solid, and this is even better than alumina by almost an order of magnitude. And then cap this same capability can be applied to a number of different distributed circuits, and a couple that are shown here. One is used in the mixer. This is a, a balance architecture. Uh, showing the amplitude and uh, phase difference, and then also a Wilkinson power divider, very common circuit within the industry. And then a folded line coupler that's been used and getting down into a 7 micron width and spacing uh, dimension. And then leveraging this further into a, a single pole double throw, uh, this is a 30 gigahertz reflective SPDT where using a very uh, well-defined EM design methodology, we've been able to achieve a first-pass success on this, where insertion loss is a 2.3 dB at 30 gigahertz. You can see how it's very well maintained out through 30 gigahertz, and then likewise, the return losses are well-behaved out through, through 35. And the key thing here is on isolation, where we're able to predict as well as um, actually achieve you know, better than 40 dB out uh, through 45 gigahertz. So it's a, a very impressive number for uh, uh, a silicon CMOS-based device. So we really are exploiting the microwave strengths of the ultra CMOS. Uh, I want to spend a fair amount of time looking at power limiters. And the reason for this is we've introduced two product power limiters that sort of change the, the way we need to think about limiters. Uh, historically, we've been doing limiters and using pin diodes. So you've got a pin region, an intrinsic region, and then a end region. And uh, very common in the marketplace, usually discrete devices. Uh, the challenge is they, or I should say the advantages of the, the pin approach is a very low insertion loss. So you can get in easily half a dB of insertion loss or less. You've also got a fairly high maximum power handling, getting up into the 100-watt type range. Uh, and they are standalone devices, so you can readily put these into a, a circuit, not worry about a power detector or control loop. Some of the disadvantages is the response and recovery time really gets to be pretty slow as you get up into high power levels. And then also the poor linearity of the, the pin diode fundamentally. And then there is limited integration with other functional blocks. This is clearly a different technology than you would have with any of the other, let's say, 3.5 technologies, um, any of the silicon-based technologies. So it's, there is some limited integration in the sense that you can get fairly complex limiters, but taking that to the next level, getting it integrated with LNAs and so forth, you're back to more of an MCM-type environment. And then you do have DC blocking caps required, and it has generally low ESD performance. So we're all familiar with the, the way our power limiter functions. At some point, the limiter begins to limit the input power level to some uh, generally controlled output power level. And there's some slope that's usually attributed to this line. And once you get into compression, into the limiting mode, um, and then the threshold level is usually fixed. And what controls that is usually the thickness of the intrinsic region. That's um, part of the diode structure. So that becomes fixed once a diode is defined. And for integrated solutions, the solution for getting to a different power level is usually stacking of devices.
devices, more devices for higher power. So once manufactured, the power handling is fixed for a given pin diode and power limiter. What uh, Peregrine brings to the table is the concept of a variable power limiting threshold. So we introduce a third terminal to introduce that control. And that solution enables a variable threshold level for a given limiter. And it can be adjusted real time or set to a fixed level. And it includes two new states. Uh, one is an unpowered state where when the entire system is shut down, so essentially the limiter is going to see zero volts, no power going to it, it introduces attenuation. And then there's also a full power reflect mode where you are literally throwing the power back to the source. And in this case, uh, setting the voltage to zero, getting to a very low conduction uh, res um, conduction level, so I should say very high conduction level, low resistance level, and therefore the uh, source is seeing twice the current. But in this state, uh, which is the general power limiting mode, you, you also have the ability to control the range or the point at which the power limiting comes into effect. So at minus 2.5 volts, we would be at roughly 30 dBm. Coming down to minus 1.5, you'd be about 24, 25. And then minus 0.7, you're down to 24, 25 dBm. And even down to 0.5, the performance behaves very well in your seeing a little bit of a softer compression, but still you're able to limit it at roughly about a 20, 21 dBm power level. Also coming with the solution is a, a very fast response and recovery time. I mentioned earlier that with the pin limiters, they tend to get very slow as you get into high power levels. Uh, here, the response time is on the order of a nanosecond. And this is for a 30 dBm, 1 watt uh, type power level uh, for where the threshold occurs. It's a 47 dBm peak um, power, so you're getting close to a, uh, a f certainly 50 watt, close to 100 watt power level. And so this is very impressive that we've been able to get to the point where we have a 1 nanosecond response and recovery time. And what is shown here is that effectively the response time of the, the limiter. So we have on a, a signal uh, trace here, we're looking at the input power and increasing that and taking it beyond the P1dB compression point of the uh, limiter and then looking at the output power of the limiter's response effectively. You can see that on both the response and then also in the recovery time that we're tracking apart from this delay from the test setup, we're virtually tracking the input signal. So this is a one gigahertz signal tone. You got one nanosecond between each one of these peaks. And so it's very straightforward to monitor and see that we're in the order of nanoseconds for the both the response and recovery time. So this has pretty uh, important aspects from just limiters as a, a way that they behaved, being able to get to a very fast response time. So we have this new capability being brought to the table, along with the ability to vary the threshold point at which the limiter kicks in. And so I want to sort of uh, take a few minutes here to describe more of a concept to start thinking about that when we think about limiters, we're usually just thinking about it being able to respond to high power levels, and that's it. There's no intelligence beyond that. But now that you've got this flexibility, we need to start thinking about limiters in a, a different way, that they can be used differently throughout their operation and throughout what I call use cases. So common term for uh, different scenarios that a system will see and have to work with. So just a very simple concept here of looking at uh, an airplane. Um, the idea is to what different scenarios is the airplane generally going to see in there? There are two things to, two main, um, I guess, scenarios and use cases I want to talk about. One is in flight. And in terms of the system, you can think of either a radar or a comm system, something that would be sensitive at its receiver input and would need limiter type functionality. So an airplane in flight where the environment is fairly well understood, the limiter protection can be treated.
created for maximum dynamic range and signal sensitivity. So in this case, you would be going for minimum insertion loss and maximum linearity. But when the plane's on the ground, I'm not really too concerned about when or where planes are off uh, 10, beyond 10 miles per se. I'm more concerned about keeping the system protected and about a very close-in range, if any range at all, because most, uh, I would say most of the, uh, uh, I guess the, from a pilot's point of view, they would be doing things more visually than necessarily looking at radar. But the, the key here would be emphasizing the power limiting aspect of the, the limiter. So increasing the front end attenuation might actually be helpful in that case. And then also, um, if I'm parked at the gate, having the system off and having protection under that condition is also a plus. And then also, if in that same state, when the system's not being used, there may be a benefit to having a full power reflect mode. So you now have two different use cases, and the, the question is, can this limiter capability be leveraged on, over those use cases rather than just being a single function with no control, no optimization across the use cases? And so a metric that's commonly used in the industry is to take a look at um, the intermodulation free dynamic range. This is basically a subset of the spurious free dynamic range where we strip off the noise floor and strip off the bandwidth uh, terms. And so we just compare basically for you looking at different cases or different uh, technologies or different solutions, just looking at two major metrics, the IP3 and noise figure. And so these are system level metrics. And the key thing is if we can keep the limiters IP3 out of, um, let's say, out of the equation so it's sufficiently high that it's not affecting the system impact, then we're looking basically at noise figure versus insertion loss trade-off. So as we look at the limiter behavior here and applying the operation to our use case example of the airplane, uh, we have in several in-flight options that we can look at in terms of uh, where it can operate in terms of control voltage, and then also how that translates into the power level that's being uh, limited. So if you remember back from the, the basic chart, this goes from about minus uh, plus 20 up to plus 30 dBm range. So it gives you some flexibility there. And then as you're landing and taxiing, you're not concerned about the dynamic range in terms of looking far for faint signals, but you're more concerned about applying that dynamic range close in. So some additional insertion loss that translates directly to noise figure, as long as, uh, again, as long as the limiter's IP3 stays fairly strong, uh, we can trade that off. And then as we get further down this curve, you're going to see that the IP3 does degrade and will probably begin to impact the overall system level. And when that happens, we're basically closing down the dynamic range of the overall system. And in general, as you're close in near the gate, that's probably not a problem. So this gives you flexibility in terms of how you set up the system operation and allows you to now to make the limiter more intelligent to the overall use of the system. So you can think of how you might take this next step to integrate things further or how you make, might make things smarter, more intelligent. You can think of a full receiver now with a limiter plus LNA and mixer. And so that's quite doable and achievable. We're no longer tied to a very specific technology here. We're doing this in the same Ultra CMOS technology that we've uh, delivered LNAs and mixers in. And then you can also think of the integration potential, that you've got smart power limiting now, quite uh, achievable, and it can be replaced with virtually any sensitive front end um, component. Uh, you can think of um, replacing multiple stage pin limiters by something that's more adaptive using uh, means of monitoring the input power and making selective decisions about what level to put the limiter at. And then also we can just simplify the overall bomb and board use that's uh, needed to implement something like that. You don't necessarily have to have a separate detector with a discrete limiter. This can all be integrated into a single solution. And this can function autonomously, meaning it can react 
directly to the RF incident power. And so you have an immediate response. Or you can also have a multi-step response. So it's something that kicks in immediately versus something that then goes through a detection and further control is applied to the limiter. So you can have a multi-step response. And that's actually what's depicted here, that a general power limiting behavior, once you get to a certain point in that power limiting, you may go to a more protective condition. Um, so you have immediate power limiting. Um, you could switch to a power reflect mode for longer term, so you get better protection and higher, higher power protection. And then also immediate response versus power measurement-based response. So it could be you're looking for a very particular power level. Once that's reached, then you do things both from a system level as well as a limiter level to give greater protection. And this can be all use case controlled, meaning if you know you're in flight, you're going to switch the system into a specific state. Or the ideal is probably a combination of both use case as well as autonomous, that you build in a very fast protective response. And this performance uh, or protection is usually performance driven, but it's always there. So it's an insurance policy protection that you've got this level of protection all the time very quickly and just suggesting maybe 80% of your uh, extreme power cases would be covered by this protection, but then you also have a very extreme uh, protection level that would be invoked by monitoring the actual power level. So this brings both intelligence as well as integration now to the limiter function. Applying that back to what we saw in the mixer, that there's no limitation now really in frequency, we can put limiters uh, across the band. This is looking at insertion loss for a, uh, a limiter that's shown here pictorially, where we're getting better than 2 dB insertion loss out through 30 uh, gigahertz. This is showing in the upper right here the behavior at 20 gigahertz uh, to the control voltage. And you can see that's behaving uh, very similarly that you can modify the range. You can see that it's lower, and this is actually part of the design of this limiter, that it's not the same limiter as the uh, production ones that we have in the marketplace, but it is a lower power limiter. So it's something we are able to trim based on the, the basics of the technology. And then also the different modes are shown here in the lower right. In the top, you've got the insertion loss, low insertion loss, um, conditions going from minus 3.3 volts on the control down to 0.5. And then you've got the system off state here where you're getting on the order of a good 30 dB of uh, insertion loss in that state. And then secondly, you can throw it into a complete reflect mode and you're, you're sending very little power. You're down at uh, 50 dB of uh, insertion loss at that point. So frequency is... Uh, again, something that can be leveraged because of the substrate, and that's, again, using the, the strength of the technology, so a smart decision from a, a technology perspective. Uh, in summary on the limiters, we have two that have been introduced, so they're uh, the 45-140 and the 450, and this first one here is targeted more for comms communication, so military tactical radars. Uh, radios, and uh, things with uh, basically the megahertz to gig low gigahertz range and targeting the threshold levels of 22 to 32 dBm variable and then the Pmax pulse to 47 dBm. And then the 450 is more for test and measurement where you're looking for very broad frequency coverage. It's got a slightly higher power range, 25 to 35 dBm, and then a similar Pmax. So along with the power limiting function, both of these limiters provide greater than 8 kV ESD production on the RF ports. That's something that uh, is taken uh, sometimes as a separate circuit to provide ESD production. And this is effectively providing that same protection on the RF ports. And it's a very high level 8 kV. And then in terms of our roadmap, just in very general sense, we are going lower in power down towards 10 dBm for very sensitive LNA applications and then extending the Pmax power handling 
up to a full 100 watt power level. All right, one of our third example this morning is uh, looking at our Ultra CMOS Global One integrated system. This is targeting our handset market. And what it includes are three separate um, integrated uh, multi mode, multi band PAs. So each one of these addresses one of the major frequency bands that the cellular handset is addressing today. So roughly 700 megahertz, 2 gigahertz, and then 2.7 gigahertz. Included in the same die as all the post PA switching to get out to the filter banks that are band specific and then coming back on with an antenna switch and antenna tuner. So this is fully integrated and a single die. Where the performance stands, and this is uh, again where the technology is really showing its strength, is against Gaia Marcinide where even today we're, we're seeing this uh, delta between our global one performance and what gas can do, and thinking gas in terms of the, the standard players in the marketplace that we're seeing this gap beginning to increase as we're applying more and more optimization at the device and circuit level. Op optimization is really matching of the device to the uh, final impedance and working through that network. And then compared to other standard CMOS offerings that have been out in the marketplace, we're seeing a dramatic uh, over 13% Delta there. So we're doing much better than CMOS, and we continue to push the envelope and getting uh, better performance now than even gas that's in the marketplace. This is at 700 megahertz, the data that's shown here. And then also I want to emphasize that this doesn't um, use any envelope tracking techniques or uh, pre-distortion techniques. So those we've demonstrated with other third parties, the, the capability there. So that's an, an adder on top of what the Global One performance uh, is able to achieve by itself. Showing two different things here with respect to Global One and also the intelligent integration. One is um, within a given major band. So this is looking at the low band and several subbands within that. We have the ability to configure that subband uh, for performance so that we retain performance as we work in different subbands within what's been defined by 3G, PP, et cetera. And so what's shown here is that we can retain the power added efficiency, peak efficiency of our much broader bandwidth than what you would achieve with a fixed uh, device. And this is what's shown here is a measured gallium arsenide PA. So it allows you to with a single device, move the band around and get better coverage, better performance across all the bands. So this is the first item, sub-bands within a major band. And then showing on the right-hand side is our LTE performance, looking at P out versus targeted. And I'm showing just the delta here so you can see how we're doing towards uh, reaching our ultimate goal. So we are doing quite well in terms of low band, mid band, and in high band, this, uh, I think most people would recognize that this is more of a design parameter that we're coming up against as opposed to fundamental device performance. So optimizing the range over which we can um, optimize the 2.7 gigahertz performance is really the, the key now. It's getting the range of configurability defined um, optimally for Global One. So some of the benefits of this. Uh, Truly, it's configurable by band and mode of operation. Uh, we can optimize things, whether it's LTE or uh, 3G WC to make. We can make trades and optimization of the performance, both in fundamental metrics as well as in frequency. And then we have improved performance versus traditional gas. And you can also think about this reconfigurable uh, ability being leveraged by how quickly it can be designed in at the phone level. So you go through a, a calibration or a, um, almost a tuning cycle on a new phone. You gather that information that becomes your standard uh, for moving forward with that manufacturing run. So it becomes very quick to optimize for a given phone. 
Uh, the last slide I want to share with you this morning, uh, when I first saw this, really sort of blew my mind away because I've done some work with load pull with amplifiers and have never seen this level of detail. And it gives you a sense of the power of what can be done when you do both an intelligent decision about what process to work with, intelligent integration, meaning uh, bringing knowledge to what you're integrating, and then being able to put that into a single solution. And this, this simply isn't possible unless you go through a, a very complex integrated um, design because you really need to get down into individual components they used in matching networks to make really refined optimization here. But you can see uh, different peaks and valleys that are, I think if you were to do this just at a, a single device, no tuning, you would probably miss and you'd probably characterize that you, you've got some sharp roll-off here that you've got to stay away from. But in reality, you've got a number of troughs, you've got a number of peaks, and as you'd expect, the uh, PAE, the power added efficiency, aligns well with P out. But you begin to see some subtleties here that you can become cognizant of and react to and actually leverage if you know they're there. So this really shows pictorially simply how uh, integration can be leveraged to provide greater flexibility, greater complexity while giving performance advantage. So in summary, uh, Peregrine Ultra CMOS is delivering intelligent integration, and we've demonstrated some RF performances uh, throughout the talk this morning. We have the KU band mixer showing basically the substrate being the, the thing that's really leveraged there, the variable threshold power limiter, which is leveraging both the technology as well as the flexibility that we can now bring to the concept of a limiter, and then as we just talked about, the global one performance and its level of integration and reconfigurableness. So we're providing through the intelligent part of it greater system capability and operational flexibility. So with the limiter, we are obviously adding the ability to respond to use cases as well as uh, giving the designer, the system level, uh, more flexibility in how they use the limiter. And then we are leveraging the, the strengths of the technology and really saw that with the high frequency capability where the substrate is emphasized there, but that has benefits even down in the, the low gigahertz range where very quickly you could be losing a lot of your signal when you start doing these very complex uh, switching networks and uh, tunable structures um, by using a very low loss substrate that part of the loss equation is taken out of, out of it. And then finally, with integration, we have complex microwave and distributed elements, and that's shown in the KU band mixer. And now we have the ability to integrate limiter functions with intelligence. It's not just a, a pin diode anymore. And then extreme RF reconfiguration, the global one is really showing, and that's, that's only possible through an integrated solution. And this is all achieved using a, a high-volume mainstream CMOS manufacturing backbone and that's coupled with the Ultra CMOS SOI technology. So I want to thank you for your time this morning, and I guess it's time for questions. Yes, yes, thank you, Peter, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we do have a number of excellent questions, so um, let's get right into that portion of today's webinar. Um, starting with this interesting question, um, how is this different from silicon germanium? Okay, Ultra CMOS is truly a CMOS-based technology. It's only CMOS. With silicon germanium, there's sort of two flavors. One is uh, just a silicon germanium HBT, meaning bipolar device. Um, I think that the, that technology is finding limited use, and what's more commonly uh, offered is a silicon germanium HBT with a CMOS uh, functionality or adder. And so you get sort of a focus on a HPT device, and then you have a CMOS part of it that's uh, more digitally uh, focused. And so what you end up with is a very specific device, the HPT, that you can use in amplifier applications, but not necessarily in control or uh, as a um, 
high-performance CMOS. You have a lot of uh, potentially parasitics related with that CMOS device or limited performance from that device. And it's also somewhat of a, a unique technology that, again, Jazz, Tower Jazz and IBM support, but it's not as um, broadly used in terms of CMOS. Okay. All right. Um, here's another question. Um, it says, how about performance comparison for WCDMA at 2 gigahertz? Um, I didn't show that data, but we're doing very well in terms of uh, WCDMA and call it 3G. Or, um, so in comparison to LTE, the performance is doing very well there also. Okay. Um, is there a fundamental technology limitation on power handling for Peregrine's power limiters? Uh, from a device point of view, the, the substrate allows us to uh, stack devices almost infinitely because the, the voltage division behaves very well. You don't have uh, leakages in the substrate that cause that stacking to degrade as it increases. So we run up against two main things. One is uh, parasitics of just the layout itself, and then parasitics of the metal traces coming into play, and that affects power handling in terms of how high we can go and to get to uh, sort of low loss applications where you're usually going to a pretty large device to get to high power levels. Okay. Um, what about the run dot cough of ultra CMOS? Our own uh, CF figure of merit is um, we have two main processes that we're working with, Ultra CMOS 8 and 10. And 8, it's about a 170 femtosecond, a second. And then for one uh, Ultra CMOS 10, it's about a 113 femtosecond. a second. Okay. And um, I don't know if you answered this in that. Uh, how low in power can the power limiter threshold go? Uh, we're going down to 10 dBm presently. And I think we're going to be adding more intelligence to go beyond that level. Okay. Looks like we have some more time. Some more questions are coming in. Um, what are your practical frequency limitations, if you would? Sort of similar to power handling in that device parasitics and resistance and the, the metal traces comes into play. Um, distributed architectures work well to address parasitics, but you end up adding more serious resistance, basically loss, as you go through a, a larger or longer um, distributed network. So those tend to be the limitations frequency-wise. From a fundamental power handling and performance, the device itself is uh, you can scale the device um, periphery to minimize its own parasitics so that they stay sort of outside of the cutoff frequency of your frequency range. So that's usually not the problem. It's more of dealing with uh, parasitics of finite layouts and resistances of metal st structures. OK. Um, when is Global One expected to hit the market, someone asked. Uh, we are anticipating revenue from Global One in the second half of 2015. Okay. Um, that seems to be all the uh, time that we have today. Uh, we'd like to thank you, Peter and Peregrine Semiconductor, for putting together this fine presentation today. Um, you and our audience can learn more about Peregrine online at uh, psemi.com. We'd like to thank you for watching and hope you'll join us again for the next webinar in our Technical Education Webinar Series.